to those that I haven't seen uh, this morning yet. Thank you, church. Um, thank you for coming. Uh, thank you for um, coming along as we celebrate the, different, uh, the differences within uh, the community of Centurion, the differences that we have as a transcultural church, as we seek to look one another in the eye, as we seek to get to know one another better, and only then, by the power of the gospel that brings us together, do we then transcend the differences and create one new community in Christ. We have a panel discussion now. There is um, five people to my right who are all going to introduce themselves. We're going to have a couple of questions that we're going to work through. At the end of our questions, there will be open time for some open questions from the floor. Um, but as we get started, the first question would be, tell us about yourself, about your heritage. When did you first learn about your heritage? Um, when, uh, tell us about your family. Uh, but as we, as we get to that question, it's important for us to posture ourselves in the sense of what is our heritage, right? Our heritage is practices, is, uh, is ideas that we live through or live by within the nucleus of the different cultures and family units that we have. So there'll be practices that we practice, there'll be traditions that we have, there'll be things that we enjoy, there'll be locations and sites that we think of as dear and close to us. That forms part of our heritage. That goes a little bit more than just what, what would be our culture, but the things that we inherit as we continue to develop as people. So when I ask about our heritage, those are some of the things that you might hear. You might hear a little bit about where they come from, maybe some of the things that they, that they would hold near and dear to them, specifically as we get to the second question. Um, but yeah, that's, that, the first question is, tell us about yourself, um, about your heritage, um, where, where do you come from? Tell us about your nucleus family, the smaller family that you might be in at the current moment. So, so Jake, would you, would you kick us off? Yeah, um, this has to be on first. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I, I, am, I am from a township called Sharpville. It's in the Val Triangle. Um, basically just bordering as you exit Gauteng going into the Free State. Uh, so predominantly the language that's spoken there is Sutu. Um, yeah, so I'm Sutu speaking, raised uh, Sutu uh, from the Val Triangle, uh, grew up there most of my life, um, went to school in Fanabelle Park. Uh, both my parents are from, from Sharpville, so um, yeah, I've, I've been there all my life. My parents have been there uh, uh, all their lives, um, yeah, and I've spent most of my time in schooling um, there as well. Yeah. Tell us about your, maybe your smaller family unit, um, tell us a little bit maybe about... Uh, how, how that family unit came to be as well. Yeah, definitely. Uh, so uh, I was born to, obviously, both my parents. Uh, parents got divorced uh, when I was three. Um, so I've, I think I've maintained really close ties with my, with my father's family, my grandfather playing a very uh, a strong father figure uh, for me in my life. Um, and then very close to my mom's family because, you know, my mom raised me um, for, for most of my life. Um, yeah, and then my dad went on and then passed away later. Uh, my mom got, uh, got remarried. So uh, I have a sibling, half-sister. Um, and, uh, and yeah, that's basically my, 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 my family context. Okay, thank you. Rochelle, tell us about a little bit about yourself, um, your heritage, um, things that you remember about your heritage as well. Uh, good morning, church. Um, so I was born and raised in Benoni. Uh, both my parents are Afrikaans, their parents are Afrikaans, but we are very, very watered down Afrikaans. Like, <laughs> I, like mo I don't even know most Afrikaans words. If you had to speak like savor Afrikaans to me, I would like misunderstand you. <laughs> so yeah, so my, but both my parents were raised like that. Both of them very watered down Afrikaans and then that just spilled over into us. Like we didn't stick to any cultures. My mom didn't stick to like Afrikaans food, anything like that. So I always say that I don't have a culture. Like, where even for today, I was like, what do I do? What do I wear? Like, I don't have a culture. So yeah, yeah. You you are married as well. Yes, <laughs> I'm married to Jake. <laughs> uh, tell, tell us a little bit about that. <laughs> mm, yeah. <laughs> so that was challenging. I hope this is what you mean, like, obviously getting, like, dating him and uh, marrying him, that was a challenge, like, for my family to accept, um, yeah, that when I got, like, when I came home with him the first time, like, my mom didn't speak to me for weeks, like, she just 
ignored me. Like, I was in their house and everything, but she, like, didn't speak to me. My dad was, like, upset. My dad, like, spoke about it, though. He was, like, outspoken about it, like... But yeah, that was a challenge. What made it easier, though, is that both my brothers had girlfriends of other races, too. So it made it a little bit easier, but at the same time, it made it very hard on me because I was, like, the last one to do it. So I feel like there was, like, a... No, like, maybe one of our kids will still marry someone from their own race. So when I came home with Jake, it was like, oh, okay, like, all three are kids, you know? Yeah. <laughs> my dad even said that to me. He was like, how can not even one of my kids <laughs> like someone from their own race, you know? <laughs> so um, that was a challenge, yeah, mm. definitely. Thank you, Rochelle. Good morning, everybody. My name is Lerato Mutsuening, and I'm a Sutu girl. Um, I'm half Sutu and half Tosa. My mom is Tosa and my dad is Sutu. So by heritage, I'm Sutu because we, we were raised to believe that um, a child always has to take their side of the, the father's side of the family. And just like Rochelle, I am a westernized Sutu and Tosa girl. <laughs> um, I'm not too deep into both cultures, but I have been exposed to both. Um, being raised, I was raised in a Sutu household, so we spoke Sutu, but then when I was with my mom's side of the family, they always spoke Tosa around me, so we had to pick it up. Um, so I can speak both languages. I'm not sure about writing and reading Kosa, but I think I can get it too. Um, so yeah, um, I don't know. I love, I love my culture. I've been exposed to both. I enjoy both. Um, and yeah, it's been, it's been a journey learning about it. Mm, thank you. Martin? Good morning. My name is Martin, as some of you know. Um, my background... Uh, my mom was Afrikaans, um, and my father was English, but sort of from German ancestry heritage in East London, down in the Eastern Cape. And my mom and my dad had met at the Bible College in Cape Town, and they started dating. And I remember when my, my mom told me when she had to introduce my father to my grandfather, on my mom's side, obviously, there was this very strong sort of... Apparently, my African side of the family has also got quite strong um, German ancestry. So my mom tried to sell my dad to my grandfather as German. <laughs> because at that stage, the whole English Afrikaans thing was still a big story, you know. You, you guys killed our women and children in the concentration camps and made them eat glass and all that sort of thing. So eventually after um, uh, this, my mom sort of introduced my dad, my grandfather just said, but he's a bloody Englishman. <laughs> so that was sort of the background that I grew up in. My first language was Afrikaans because my mom spoke Afrikaans. And then when I was about two or three, I realized that there was this other person in the house that spoke something that I didn't understand. And eventually I realized that's my father and he speaks English. So I started <laughs> speaking English. <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah, and then sort of um, I went to English nursery schools and primary schools and high schools and sort of become anglicized in that way. But I always remember that I never really fit in anywhere. Um, I didn't fit in with the Afrikaans side of things because Afrikaans people would think, oh, but you're a Roy Neck, you're a Hans Kaki, you're a you know, half-breed um, betrayer. And the, the English people, when they found out that I spoke Afrikaans, they were like, yo, you're a clutch plate and a rock spider, you know, that sort of stuff. I don't know why they call them clutch plates. So, but I always, I never really fit in. I was always in this duality between being half Afrikaans, half English. So that also allowed me to um, see both cultures and to also be kind of like, be able to step out of the box and see culture for what it really was. Whereas I think that people that just grew up in one culture have a bit more of a difficult time doing that. Um, and then I came to a stage somewhere in, in high school where I started picking the good parts of both my cultures and trying to let go of the not so good parts of my culture. Mm. So yeah, my mom, my, my dad, uh, my mom was divorced. Uh, my dad remarried, he remarried and uh, he married a colored lady down in Port Elizabeth, mm -hmm. which was also, I think, quite a challenge for my dad and my stepmom. Um, at the time, it wasn't too long after 94, 
but there I also learned something new about a different culture and how two different cultures can can love each other and live together. Yeah. yeah. So you you are married as well. Right? Yes, I'm married. Can you tell us a little bit about that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, it's, that's the lady there that I'm married to now. Um, she's also from an extremely different culture and from the other side of the planet. So yeah, that's been another interesting journey. And she's from Colombia. Okay. Yeah. She's literally on the other side of Earth from us. <laughs> and we, I don't know, most South Africans know nothing about South America, like literally nothing. So it's been a very interesting journey so far. Yeah, thank you, Martin. <laughs> Hi, everybody. So I am the representation of that part of the, country, of the planet, <laughs> <laughs> on the other side. Uh, my name is Karina. I have a very Afrikaans name for some reason. My parents decided that was my name, and I throw people off here in South Africa. Um, so my mom is Mexican, and my dad is Mexican. So I'm 100% Mexican. Um, growing up, I grew up in Mexico. Um, I only left home when I was 26, 28, something like that. Um, so I grew up in a very monocultural country. You, um, you are born in Mexico and you are Mexican, it doesn't matter. Your background, your heritage, whatever. Like you are just a Mexican. Obviously every family has its own traditions and different things, but is very, very monocultural in one hand. On the other hand, we have 168 um, ethnic groups in, in Mexico. So it's, uh, in one side, is very monocultural because everybody is Mexican. But on the other hand, we have a lot of diversity, especially on the south of Mexico and on the north of Mexico. Um, so that's how I grew up. Um, so when I, I got introduced <laughs> to my own heritage when I left Mexico, because people started asking me, what is your background? Like, where, where are your ans like, ancestors? Or that? Like, um, <laughs> well, I'm Mexican. Like, th there's not such a thing of going like back, back, and, or like keeping a record like your great-great-grandfather was German or your great-grandmother was Sutu, and so that was like a very interesting season for me when I left, when I left home. And when I left home, I was introduced to 54 different nationalities in the organization I was working with. So it was like a big, big change, and a big, big like, eye-opening uh, that opened a completely different world to me to see how other people are and how other people's cultures are in comparison with, with my only point of reference. Yeah. Tell us, some, you're also married? I am married. <laughs> if you see that guy there with a poncho, <laughs> <laughs> that is AJ. Um, pretty much the reason I'm here in <laughs> South Africa. Um, and we have two beautiful girls who are um, South African Mexican. Uh, yeah, so that's my immediate family here. Um, in Mexico, as in the African culture, your immediate family is not just your husband and your kids. So my grandmother is here. My, my, no, my grandmother. <laughs> my um, mother-in-law is here, which is part of my nucleus as well. So it's not just us, it's us. <laughs> Thank you. So, church fam, this is this is part of the people who form part of our communities. It's always good to learn and, and then get to know other people, get to know where they come from as we as we look to get to know one another better. So, thank you guys for being here and for sharing a little bit about yourselves. So, the second question, it's for everyone. Just we're not going to go in a straight line. Let's see whoever wants to take it first. Um, so, tell us some things about your heritage that you that you appreciate. Or some things that you like or that you enjoy. Maybe tell us some things about your heritage that you don't um, like that much or some things that you might want the gospel to challenge or redeem. <clears throat> yeah, I think one of the things I really appreciate about my heritage is that, um, so even in Sharpville at one stage, um, 
there were 17 people living in a, in a four-room house. Uh, and that's always been like home for us because there were grandparents, aunts and uncles and all their kids living there. Uh, and so there was always a beautiful sense of like family. So even if it was clustered, it was just beautiful because I had people that I felt like were brothers and sisters. And that's why even with Sutu people you'll notice like cousin is not really like a big thing. I mean, that might be like a technical term, but for us it's like, no, that's my brother or that's, that's my sister. Uh, and so that's a, that's a, I guess, a very beautiful thing. Um, but uh, I do think that sometimes they, that creates too much um, interdependence on one another. Um, I think there they, they were times where um, even parental um, influence needs to be stronger and you, you don't really get to take on your own identity, I guess, as a, as a family, which can be challenging. Um, because I've seen even firsthand in my family where um, parents would just abdicate their responsibility um, and, and, and just have a view that it's not, it's not for them to, to, to deal with, which is not, it's not always helpful. Um, yeah, because then you find relationships where kids are closer to grandparents um, and, and, and parents, I guess, are just so far removed and have no say or don't understand where their kid is at and know them that well. But it's predominantly because uh, the the parents would then send off their kids to be raised by the by the grandparents. Yeah, yeah, true. Yeah. yeah. So sometimes that that would that would usually be the case that grandparents would stay and 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 and, and, and raise kids. Um, although for me it was different. Like there were times when my my mom was traveling, so then I would stay with grandparents. Uh, but then there were times when I when I stayed with 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 her. Uh, but for most of my life, she's been uh, uh, she's been actively there um, raising me, and I can definitely see see the difference, which is why I'm, I'm bringing that up. Um, just the fact that she she was involved even as a single parent was formative. So I got the full full rounded experience. Yeah. Big on family, and and I loved it. Anyone else want to take a, a shot uh, at uh, what you enjoy about your heritage and maybe what are the things that you hope the gospel would redeem? Um, just looking at both Kossas and Sutus, I found some similarities, right? There are traditional practices in both that I have enjoyed. I love both languages. Like, if you listen to Kossa people speak, you just go like, oh my gosh, how do you guys do that? And then you listen to Sutu people speak, especially from the Sutu. And you're like, oh my word, how do you guys do that? There's just something about the way they speak that makes me want to just listen to them all day. And what I love about those two languages is when they are incorporated in music. So it's just such a beautiful thing. <laughs> like, I can't even you know, imagine. But then there's also a practice, like a traditional practice that they both have in common that I think the gospel should be intervened. And that's like this initiation school. It's very popular um, among both um, heritages, and I don't think it's particularly right, in, in my opinion. Um, what, so what they do is like an initi initiation school. So what they do is they take um, young men of age, and they take them to like mountains. It's supposed to be a secret, like nobody's supposed to know what happens there, but they go for like weeks, and some, some of them go for months on end. And then they come back, usually around um, the time of December, and then they come back and they have like this huge ceremony where they welcome back home and, and identify them as men or women. In Sutu, both male and female can attend this thing. And then in Kosa, just males. So they come back and they are, they are declared grown and declared man or woman. And in my observation, nothing has like really changed to the positive. Because what they've been exposed to mostly is just alcohol to declare them man or, or, or woman. And what I have noticed after that, like when I just tracked down the people that I've known who went to the, that initiation schools, like their lives don't turn out too great after that. So I'm like, what's the point, you know? And, and most of the practices, at that practice, I think it's mostly based on ancestral worship as well. So I'm just like, maybe if we could do like a gospel thing there, like is it really necessary for them to go um, to that initiation school, and if if so, what's the point? You know, because I have not seen it. To be honest, I've never seen one person who's been there who has like a tremendously amazing life that you want to follow. So I think that would be great to to change. Yeah. you mentioned ancestral worship. What is that? 
Ah, and this is where um, people believe that the dead can do something for them in return. Like they slaughter cows, it's, it's like a blood sacrifice, where they slaughter whatever animal at the time. It could be a sheep, it could be a cow, depending on how big the ceremony should be. And they, they dedicate it to the dead um, so that they could give them answers of whatever questions that they may have. Or if, if it's wealth that they want, they worship the dead to ask that they give them wealth or they give, cleanse their name, or just give them others, they do that for offspring, like if they can't have, like can't produce offspring, they go to the dead and they slaughter these animals, um, you know, so that they could be fruitful in that, in that, um, in that space, yeah. And then do you think there is a, a combination of both ancestral worship and God within maybe some of those cultural spaces? Yes, um, with the sutra specifically, I've, I've, I've heard, and I've actually seen that they, they include both. Um, when you ask certain people what they believe in, majority is Christian, but they also do these um, um, traditional practices where they go to either a, a traditional healer or whatnot to you'd consult, they call it, but they also say they pray to God at the same time. So, yeah, they, they kind of mix them together. So that's some of the practices that you believe the gospel should redeem and... and, and uh, yeah, 100%, yes. Thank you, thank you for sharing that. My heritage, okay. Um, from the English side of things, obviously I have my nice English language that I can speak. Um, as well as, as thanks to that. So that helps me to communicate with quite a few people on the planet. Um, I hate that. Um, pudding, there's a certain pudding that you get on Christmas Day. Uh, like a brandy type pudding. Okay. And from, from that side of my, my dad's sort of family, other than the, um, my dad being saved at a quite a young age and taking us to church from the get-go, I sat in church from the day I was pretty much born. Um, there wasn't much else that I would really thought was fantastic about the English slash German side of my culture. Whereas on the Afrikaans side of things, there were lots of good things. Bride and bolt on. This <laughs> going into the bush pile. There, there, were, there was endless good things about the Afrikaans culture that I adopted and, and that made part of myself. Obviously, there were some bad things there as well. Um, I know from my dad's side, it was very much a kind of a, uh, a culture of you go do X and then from like uh, 3 o'clock in the afternoon, you drink. With your buddies, you go to a pub, you go to a club, bowls, whatever it is, and then you drink until you can't drink anymore and you go home and then the next day repeat. You know? So I don't think that was a good thing because I think there's more to life than going to a pub or club or thing and just drinking and talking to people. The Afrikaans side um, was very much sort of, I think the, the, the bad things were that whole self preservation thing that comes from, I think far in history. And if you look at the history of the Afrikaans people, basically since 1652, they've been under threat. If you go to Cape Town, they were supposed to be growing fruit and vegetables there, but instead of finding farms, you find a fort. There was problems from the get-go, from day one. So I think that it's, it's much better now, it's changed a lot since 94 and all that sort of thing, but it's deep-seated thing of um, we have to preserve ourselves, we have to protect ourselves, we have to um, look after one another. So it was always a sort of exclusive type of thing where if you weren't one of them, then you weren't one of them. And as I mentioned, I was only half of one of them. So I always <laughs> felt that, that sort of never being a part of them, but still, to me, I was part of them. And then on the English side of things, well, you know, um, you can speak Afrikaans, so you're not 100% one of us either. You're mm -hmm. like a bit of a, you know, betrayer, if I could call it that. And there's nothing I could do about it. That's how I, I grew up. That's, that, that was just the, the, the situation I was born into. So I think, I think the, the whole self-pressure, the preservation is the thing, needs to be let go. People are, were too worried about preserving themselves, preserving their identity, and preserving their lifestyle, preserving their people and their setup and their families and stuff like that. And they completely, you know, sort of missed the whole point of the rest of the people in South Africa. 
And, and I grew up in an issue, I grew up in a time where it wasn't really a black-white type, type of cultural issue. It was a white-white cultural issue most of the time. It was my biggest issue growing up. So I think, you know, when, once, uh, I think I'll, I'll answer this question in one of the next questions that comes in. But that's sort of my heritage, the pros and the cons of my heritage. There was really good things, really bad things. And I tried to take the good and incorporate that and try to sort of reject and distance myself from the bad stuff. And then why would you, what would you think is the, the reason for the self-preservation idea or, or, or sentiment that sort of moves within that, within that African dance culture? I just think it comes from history, from, you know, it's the, the Dutch landed at the Cape, they were supposed to grow fruit and vegetables to supply the ships around Africa to India and stuff like that. And there was issues with the locals. And then they discovered diamonds, and then there was issues with the British, and then they moved away from the British, and then they discovered gold, and then they never had their own thing. They never had their own thing. They were always being chased and, and ruled by somebody else. And that growth, that, that feeling of we want something for ourselves just became stronger and stronger and stronger. And eventually it became a bad thing. So, you know, I don't know if that answers the question. Um. Something that you like and enjoy about your, your, your heritage and something that you would want to see the gospel in deep. Um, something that I love about my heritage is how not just Mexicans but Latin people in general are very um, open, like welcoming. Um, uh, hospitality is a massive thing. You, we do everything around the table. We do business around the table. We laugh around the table. We cry around the table. Everything is food and hospitality. So that, I think that is. Um, that is something that I love about my culture and my heritage. Um, I love that um, our families are so big and loud. <laughs> um, you should talk to Asia when he comes to visit. It is a lot. <laughs> a lot of people, a lot of talking, a lot of talking over each other. Uh, so that's something that I really, really enjoy. Um, a little bit of background, Mexico is a Catholic um, country, but Catholicism in Mexico is very well mixed with um, answers, like things that were there before. So when, when the Spanish brought Catholicism to Mexico, um, they didn't just, uh, the, the, the Catholicism practice in Mexico is not just um, pure Catholicism. So it got intertwined with what it was before. Um, so one of the um, parties, well, we have lots of parties. We, we party on, on everything. Um, <laughs> yes, it is true. <laughs> <laughs> um, one of those parties is the Dia de Muertos, which is the Day of the Death. And uh, in which the Day of the Death. Um, before Halloween was a thing, we had that for hundreds and hundreds of years. So what happened on that day is that the families are going to make an altar in their houses for their family members who are dead, like the grandmother, the great grandmother, um, and then they will then there will be like foods offerings. There will be flowers. Like the food, it will be like the favorite food of so and so, and the belief is that um, on that day, your grandmother, grandfather, father, whatever, whoever, will come and enjoy the meal with you, will spend time. There's people who go to the cemeteries. Um, the, the cemeteries will be full of people having lunch with their relatives, um, and there will be music, and there will be, uh, they will be playing the favorite, the favorite things, the favorite music, the favorite favorite food. Um, and I think sometimes things that from our culture not only needs to be redeemed but it needs to be completely challenged um, because there is no redemption of certain things. For example, in the Mexican culture, this, um, the 
Bible tells us that when we die, we die. We don't come back. So it's it's a massive kind of like you open the door to not your relative but something else to come into your life. So um, that is something that that in it, it needs to be challenged completely. Um, the Christian population in Mexico is two percent only. So. So the, the, the Christian population in Mexico is 2% only, so born again Christians. So when you become a Christian, it's very difficult because you get all these social things that are around, all these things that the Bible says, this is not good, then you cannot participate. Um, so it is a little bit, a little bit difficult, but I think, um, yeah, the things that you cannot just play around and, and say, let's find a way to redeem this because there are things that are not redeemable. Yeah. So, thank you. Uh, so for me, I, I agree with Martin. Like the Brian, like every weekend uh, was very nice. <laughs> the Brian and the rugby, like my family, like rugby really matters to them, you know, and <laughs> it always has. So that was fun. It was a, like a fun thing to experience growing up. Um, and then in my context specifically, I think I wasn't, because I wasn't raised so strictly out of cons, I feel like it helped me adapt after school. So I had a, a job at an English primary school and I we only spoke English. And I feel like I adapted very quickly. Um, started attending an English church, and it was normal to me. Like, I wasn't raised in an Afrikaans church, I was raised in an English church. You know, so I feel like for me personally that helped me like the, the context I was raised in. And then something that needs to be redeemed is racism, like, <laughs> yeah. So it's still a very big thing, like things are changing, definitely a little bit, like, but it's definitely still a thing. Um, not too long ago, I had a fam family member even make a racist comment in front of me, and they know that I'm married to Jake. Jake wasn't there, so they felt comfortable enough to do it, you know. So I know it's still a thing. I know, like, imagine if we're not around, what do they say when we're not around? You know, myself or my brothers, like. So it's still a very big thing. I also had a family member who um, has, has never met me. Like, they would come to my parents' house and they would ignore me. They would just walk past me. Um, and that obviously also, like, kind of broke my relationship with them. Like, I was like, okay, I don't want a relationship with this person if that's what they're like. Because they'll come in and they'll still greet me. They'll be sweet to my kids, but then ignore Jay completely. So, and then last year, we were at my grandmother's house for a bride, and this family member was there. And he finally actually spoke to Jake. He spoke to Jake, he got to know him. They were actually like getting together. And he, he went to his wife, and he was like, oh, this guy's actually all right. <laughs> like, yeah. <laughs> no one said he was it, you know? Like, you just, you just didn't want to get to know him, you know? So, yeah. So this next question is for, um, you can start Rochelle, Rochelle and Kelly. So you guys are married. Um, how does um, Jake's culture, maybe Rochelle, how does Jake's culture um, reflect or or how does it uh, sit within your cultural space? You married, you, you probably have, you, you have your parents and you've got extended family. How has marrying Jake affected your look out on, on, on heritage and culture? So, so to be honest, like, we were just speaking about that the other day, and uh, Jake had a conversation with someone else, and they had spoken about how we actually live a very white life. Like, we actually not very much in, in, in his culture. We actually live a very comfortable life to my culture, if that makes sense. Um, there's nothing very suited that we actually do as a family, like, as our, like, like us and the boys, for instance. Um, there have been instances though where I have been offended or you know like um, maybe like s things that might be expected of me where I'm like I wasn't raised like that, you know what I mean? Um, mostly from his family though, not, from, not necessarily from him. Um, I think he went into, the, I, I don't know, I can't speak for him, but I think he went into the marriage knowing 
that he is marrying someone from a different culture. So he was very aware of that. So like, I think in the past it has been like, oh, like, would this have been easier if he married someone from his culture, you know? Like, they were raised like that. It would have been fine for them. If this was expected of them, they would have done it, you know, because it's expected. Um, even the thing with the, like, the grandparents raising the kids. Like, that often gets to me. Like, when they're like, no, when are you sending your kids to come with us? And I'm like, I'm not going to. It's my kid. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, I wasn't raised like that. Like, you know what I mean? So it's my child. I want to raise my child. And I think in the past, I've been like, maybe like a little bit offended when, it, when that question keeps getting asked. Um, even by other family members. No, we're not they're gonna go stay with their grandmother, you know what I mean? And I'm just like, I don't want them to, you know? Like, yeah, there's stuff like that where, where maybe I feel a little bit offended or I feel like, oh, like, would it, would it have been easier if he married someone from his own culture? Yeah. So you mentioned one thing, that the, the parents wanting the kids to come in and live with them. What else, maybe, what are some of the other things that you, that you expected to sort of know and embrace within, within that culture as you, as you now have transitioned into that culture of humanity. So, so I have to say though, like with Jake's mom, like she's also actually been quite understanding that I wasn't raised the same. So like I have to appreciate that because for me, it's not just the way I was raised. I'm also quite a shy person. Like I can't come into someone else's house and just, this is my house now. I married your son, this is my home, you know what I mean? Which uh, his mom often makes that comment, like no, this is your house. But I still refer to it as her house because, you know what I mean, like my house is my house. I wasn't raised like that, do you know what I mean? Once you move out of your house, like my parents' house is my parents' house. You know, I don't just go there. I still ask my mom for permission to do things, to do things, you know. We, like maybe, like, at the po in the past, I've, I would have been like, no, like ask your granny, this is her house. And she wouldn't like that. She'd be like, no. Like, uh, like maybe hurt or maybe like offended that I'm not seeing it as my house because I'm a child now, you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, so. Yeah, thank you, thank you for sharing that. Um, maybe Kari, if, if you could answer similar questions. So what, um, since, since being married, how does, how does marriage affect your heritage? Um, I think, AJ is, it's like a, he, first of all, he is half Afrikaans, half English. So, <laughs> so he himself is a little bit confused. <laughs> um, so it's not like a, like just one culture, and as well our experiences. Um, I met AJ or in a on a ship on a missionary ship where we had experience like a ton of different cultures. So. I think something that um, has affected or like how our own family's culture is to uh, make our circle bigger, if that makes sense, to open our household and to open our household for everybody. Um, I think that's something that is very important for us. Um, I'm not sure it comes from my, <laughs> my culture or his culture or heritage. It comes from basically the gospel, I think, and how the gospel has, uh, how the Holy Spirit has been transformed us. Um, so we are very um, active or on, uh, proactive on where our girls are going to go to school. Um, where are we living, how are we living, who is invited to our house. Um, our house is like pretty much the creation of the complex because all kids are welcome. So <laughs> it's hard work. <laughs> but I think it's, it's how, how the Lord is asking us, our family to live, to broaden our circle, to broaden our circle. And then I think that brings a richness to our lives and to, to the lives of our daughters. Um, because it would be very, um, very sad if to be only our us. <laughs> um, AJ asked me, has asked me if I want to go back to Mexico and I say like, I don't think I can anymore because I will miss this, the diversity. I will miss the, 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 uh, the um, yeah, how my life is better because of each one, they, every you and each one of you. Um, something that his culture has uh, changed my 
object or heritage is how early African people <laughs> get <give> up. <laughs> Seriously, why? <laughs> the first time I came to South Africa, we were not in Asia, came to visit. And then um, it was so cold. I was living in Thailand that the average temperature is 36 degrees. And South Africa, I think that year was like one of the coldest. I was freezing and then um, Alta comes to me and says, oh, tomorrow, Saturday, we're going to go to the Buramark. Oh. And I'm like, okay, cool. Um, at what time do I need to be ready, you know, like, because you are like, and I was just like visiting, so like, <laughs> put on hair, makeup, like presentable, right? And she's like, I think we're leaving at 4.30. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not, I endured it, <laughs> I haven't embraced it yet. <laughs> and uh, something that I also really, really like is, um, from his family is their love for the outdoors. Yeah. It's just, um, it's a completely different experience to go out. Um, South Africa is such a beautiful country and yeah. with so different animals and hojos. <laughs> Birds. <laughs> so, and I just love me to see as well my daughters uh, loving, loving uh, nature and the bush. And I think that is something that is amazing. Yeah, thank you for that. I know that love for the for, for the nature and being disconnected is a big thing for for AJ. Maybe not so for everyone because we, we might have not known electricity that much. So, so going out into the bush where there isn't electricity, maybe for uh, is a little bit more harder. Uh, maybe for for Martin, the next the next question um, it, is it true that the Afrikaner people like wake up early in the morning? Is it what can I say? Like is it the, is it a thing? Like is it the early start of the morning? And, I think if you're a purebred, yes. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm not purebred, so no. <laughs> so, so what makes it hard for people within your heritage to accept Christ as Lord? I think it's it a lot to do with sort of pride, I think. So pride from heritage from your um, pride from what you've achieved, or pride from surviving some sort of a pride in what you've, you've done and achieved. So if you're proud and you think that you're good enough, then you're not going to, you're, not, you're going to think you're okay. You're going to think you're okay. Um, you don't need this. You're good enough. You're good enough. You're going to get into heaven anyway. You know, it's, that's definitely a, a big factor, I think, in my sort of cultural background and heritage. Um, yeah, and people, people go to church, but they don't go there to listen to the word or to feed their souls. They go there to show off their nice car or their nice family and stuff like that. That is in my experience. So that's one of the things I think that's, that makes it difficult for, for people of my sort of background to come to the Lord. Thank you for sharing. Narato Jake, this is also for you. What makes it difficult for people with your heritage to, to accept Christ as Lord? Mm, I think holding on to things of old, I think my people have a hard time letting go. And that goes also to that ancestral thing I spoke about earlier. Um, I was with my cousin the other time, like a few years ago, and I was visiting her. And so in my family, most like I've always been known as the Christian. Right? I've been, I was raised as a Christian, my, both my parents have been Christian, so I was raised up with that, and it, not really vocal, but it was kind of like a stigma that was put on me, that she's Christian and she will not deny it. And so as we were just chilling at her house, I remember she also had two of her friends come over, and we were discussing something about um, moving forward. So she's very big on planning and trying to get things done, and she's also very big on putting ancestors first as a form of sending a prayer to God. So I challenged that. I'm like, but why not go to God directly? 
Like, why does there have to be a third party in between when the third party was already there and has already given you freedom to the Lord himself? So why do you have to bridge through someone who's already dead um, to make that petition for you? And I remember how passionate she got. <laughs> and I was not very confident at the time. So she got really passionate. And now there was three against one. So I was the only one defending the gospel. And there were like three other people telling me that um, ancestral worship is the way to go to approach God because of how they were raised. So that was a very difficult conversation to have, number one, because I was also not confident enough to almost not defend, because Jesus does not need defending, but to speak up about ways that are right and um, ways that aren't quite right in approaching God. So, um, and then I noticed that, because she's young, she's like two years younger than I am, and she's so passionate about letting the dead like you know come into her relationship with God and she's passionate about that so I felt really challenged and I was like like I saw it I saw it like I looked at my entire family because I've been very privileged to be in like all my family members like I'm into the lives of almost every every one of my family members and so I, I just tracked back and thought and looked into it and I'm like even my uncles they have a difficult time understanding that you can go to God directly. So if maybe they could just let that go and they could know and that light could be brought to them yeah. that you can approach God just as God and not the dead are the dead, then that would be a much um, lighter transition. And to know that with Jesus, life is easier. There's no need for slaughtering. There's no need for massive, you know, celebrations all the time and things like that that cost money, you know. So you can just come, kneel, pray, and believe you're hurt, you know, so that unbelief and, and that faith system should be should be challenged. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, sure. That's brilliant. Um, it's, I think it's extremely unfortunate um, that there aren't many churches like Fellowship City because I think the challenge with 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 my with my people is that we don't have a a gospel lingo for what it means to be uh, uh, black, to be Mosotu, uh, and be a Christian. Uh, and so I find that my people, we're sort of in this uh, tug of war, and that's why the syncretism is there, is the gospel is still perceived as something that's foreign, and so we don't want to lose our cultural identity and who we are as a, as a people. And so that's why syncretism is so easy for us in my culture, because we strong church um, sort of ties with like Dutch reform but in the in the township very strong on that church every Sunday sung hymns sound preaching but then you go back home and there are practices that just don't and so there was always a disconnect and so I think the reason why people in my sort of tradition will struggle to accept Christ, Christ as Lord is because Christianity is still perceived as a as a foreign thing um, and Unfortunately, there just isn't any any lingo, anything given to them to say, hey, you can be black, you can be Mosotu, uh, and be a Christian. You don't have to let go of your heritage. And unfortunately, the history of Christianity in South Africa has been predominantly white. Um, and people just don't identify with it. And that's what's beautiful about this space. And so, so the challenge is here. Uh, cultures are seen, they are valued, they are embraced. Um, and I think with my people, we just haven't experienced that. There's always been the challenge that if I want to be a Christian, I'm going to have to let go of that. Uh, and, and, and that's always going to be a barrier. Um, and so if transculturality is something that's there, where we say we see you, God knows, God, God made you as a people, God gave you your culture. There are things that God wants to redeem, but God sees you. You don't need to become something else. Uh, as you are, Christ loves you, and as your culture is, the gospel can transform it and bring beauty out of it. But they, they don't they, they don't know that. Yeah, yeah, thank you for that. Last question before we take a couple of questions from the floor. So how can we be a community that continues to reflect, embrace, and enjoy the diversity of our context? Kari? Um, I think I, I spoke a little bit about this in the previous question. I, I will say we need to um, make our circle bigger and open. 
is um, invite people to your inner circle. We are very like I am. <laughs> very I like I like comfort and then I like easy and I like no conflict. <laughs> that is that is how we like it, right? But I think we really want to be a church that embraces mm, the diversity. The diversity. Yeah. We need to make our circles bigger mm. and open. Um, and there will be friction um, and iron sharpens iron. Um, it is going to be hard and there is going to be hard conversations, especially because of the history of this country. Um, but if we don't invite others into our lives, um, we will just be saying, Hi, how are you? Oh, today is so cold. Mm -hmm. And we don't pass, pass that. <laughs> I think from my observation and experience with being on this planet now for 47 years is you know, we live in an extremely diverse country as all of you know and the only thing that I've seen that can get people to start forgetting about their colour, start forgetting about their cultural practices, start forgetting about their language, start forgetting about um, what they have achieved and haven't achieved and where they've come from is salvation. When the Holy Spirit starts working in your heart and you, you're, you become a believer, you truly know what it is that you believe, then you don't worry about people's color anymore. You don't worry about what language they're speaking. You don't worry about where they grew up or haven't grown up. That stuff doesn't matter so much anymore. Not that it doesn't matter. Of course it matters. It matters to everybody. But it's, it matters less. What becomes more important is when you see that other person who's not like you. And you're like, that person knows what I know. And that person knows what I know. And then, as soon as you start identifying a few people that know what you know, you start building a new family. You start, you know, it's not about what you speak, what you do. It's about, ah, oh, you know what I know. We're on the same page. We're walking this journey together. So that to me is, is the way that it's, that it's going to happen. It's the Holy Spirit climbs into your heart, shows you some things, and then you start enjoying the people that also know what you know, mm -hmm. that have also been transformed by, yeah. by the Word of God and by Christ and mm -hmm. what He means, means for us and what He, what he did for us. Yeah. Yes, I think Kat has got a good point but because... You won't be able to identify other people around you that know what you know unless you expose yourself to them. So, you know, we can all sit in our little cultural groups in our own little places and you won't see the other people with different cultures and different um, backgrounds that know what you know. So you won't think that they know what you know and therefore you'll still keep into your little own huddle, um, so to speak. So, yeah, you've got to open yourself up. Yeah. You have to start looking out there at everybody in South Africa. And South Africa doesn't just consider, consist of South Africans. There's a lot of other people here from the rest of the planet, which makes it a <laughs> beautiful place. And, um, yeah, you, you, if you, you know, you're not the only one yeah. that Jesus is saving. So, yeah. just go and look around. There's a whole bunch of them out there. And get to know that most of them are extremely beautiful people as a result. Yeah, thank you. Just one more. And uh, I'm going to ask some questions from the floor um, in a moment after this last question. Maybe someone who's burning to, to give us that last answer. Um, how do we become a church that reflects on places and enjoys a diversity of its context? Yeah, I agree with both of you. And I think also remembering that there is no competition. The biggest way to receive one another is understanding that I'm not competing with you, you should compete with me. Um, that's the easiest way that we could receive one another, okay? Your culture is your culture, my culture is mine, but we come together, we're, we're human beings first. So if we can relate on being human beings first, then I think it will eradicate almost every other problem there is in the room. And it will be easier um, to, to even like, you know, accept you and accept everything that you come with because now I'm open. I'm not competing with you. There's nothing that I am trying to enforce 
in you and there's nothing that I'm trying to defend myself from coming from you. So being open like that and the one thing that I can think that could get us to that point is love. So if we see each other in the eyes of love, um, that could just solve all the problems. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, so some questions from the floor, just raise a hand and then the mic will come to you. So we, we believe that a way that we would uh, transcend the differences in, in, our, in our cultures and create one new community in crisis is through turning from being shoulder to shoulder but looking at eye to eye. And that is how we get to know one another better. That is how we get to see and experience the diversity and maybe even the similarities that exist within our, within our different heritage and contexts. And then we get to build that fondness and love and appreciation for the other and start to see the other as, as a brother, as a sister, as someone that, that is that's formed part of your nucleus family. Uh, AJ, I'm so sorry, I'm gonna ask you. No. Anyone to answer. So the heritage is rich, the gospel is true. How do you as a Christian respond when your heritage is offended? in a way that it's not necessarily challenging the gospel. So it's challenging who you are as a person and your history. How does the gospel help you to love the person that is offending you or your heritage? So, um, and I'm going to, so I don't want Curry to answer, but when she is thought of as white African, but she's Latin, she's not white and she's not from the West, in her instance, how she responds, but maybe each of you have a, a view of how, how does the gospel enable you to, to love through that. You want to go first, Kari? But why me? I saw you, I can see you, and I'm like, oh, you're going um, How? Um, well, I realize that I offend a lot of Afrikaans people and white people just for the fact that I am not Afrikaans or white, but I look like this. Um, I, I'm especially living here in, in, in Littleton. Um, people start speaking Afrikaans to me and I'm like, muchas gracias, pero yo no hablo Afrikaans. <laughs> so I think like, like it's not, I, I don't, I don't f find, uh, I'm not offended if someone assumes that I am um, a, a white person. Um, genetically, I am not. I just happen to look like this. Um, but I think with grace. Um, and um, sometimes people speak out of ignorance. Uh, most people are speak out, out of ignorance because um, when I say when I say to people uh, I'm not South African I'm Mexican, uh, the years changes and then they try to figure out where Mexico is. Some people get it in Europe, <laughs> other people <laughs> get it in South America. But it's just that, like I think grace and but at the same time I'm talking from a point of I don't have no baggage. Um, as many South Africans do, of hurt, of, of uh, mistreatment, or, or misunderstandings, or whatever. So I, I, I start from a completely different uh, place where I can just play with it, mm. or joke about it, mm. um, that makes sense. Yeah. Um, yeah, I just think that w once you, you are saved, then Christ removes most of your baggage. And when your baggage is removed, then you don't have this chip on your shoulder and you have to constantly be defending your own culture and your own ways of doing things and stuff like that. And then you can start seeing people for who they really are. Um, and that makes all the difference. Can we get another question, uh, maybe another two questions uh, from the floor? Hi everyone. Um, so you guys are all in mixed cultural families or mixed race families. So 
I just wanted to ask, how would you guys expose your kids to the different cultures that you come from, different languages? And this is sort of a follow-on question. When a child prefers one culture or one language, how would you sort of deal with that? Would that be a negative thing, or would you try and, yeah, be positive about that? Yeah. Oh, I know for sure this is not for me. I don't know if you <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So, so, yeah. Okay, I, I definitely relate to that. I think, again, the the challenge with us is that, like I, I like went to English schools, all of that, um, and so it's so easy for our family to sort of be monoculture. Uh, like my younger brother, when he grew up, he didn't know a word of Sotho uh, until about the age of six or seven, and my grand grandparents were like, no, like that's not going to happen. Uh, and one thing that was very helpful was like exposure. He doesn't spend enough time with his other family members. Uh, and so I think a, a, a challenge for us is that we've noticed that we sort of have our own uh, uh, trajectory. We live in our own little world. And so what, is, what has helped for us is uh, exposing, like intentionally deciding to spend time uh, and doing activities that sort of uh, enculturate them to, to the good things about your culture. Um, so the boys would spend time with Rochelle's parents and then they would spend time with, with my parents, but intentional time where they can ask questions, um, where they can go to places like Shopville and ask about their history. What is this? Why do people live like this? Uh, and so exposing them to, to sort of the, 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 diverse, uh, the diversity uh, within our marriage. Um, and it, it's very difficult to do, but it's something that we're intentionally trying to do, just exposing them in places where they can ask questions about things we know that they're not usually uh, going to be conscious of. Um, I think I, I agree with Jake. Exposure. Ex exposure. Exposure, yeah. Um, uh, I'm the minority here, like talking about my family, right? I'm the minority here. I'm the only one who speaks Spanish in my family. So at some point, um, we had to make a decision to get a, maybe a tutor for the girls. Um, and make it, uh, we went to Mexico last year. So the times that we go to Mexico is like maybe every <laughs> four or five years because it's just so expensive to go. Um, but this last time that we've been there, the girls realized that they are part of something else, not just South Africa. Mm. So I think exposing your kids to to all of your family, uh, try to make connections. Um, your kids are still tiny. So maybe when as they grow up, just like mer making connections, connections, connections with, with both parts of the family. My girls have, uh, they spend most of their days with their grandmother. Uh, they see them all the time, they see that part of the family all the time, which doesn't happen with my side of the family. So it's, it takes a, a lot of effort um, and energy to, to give them the identity that belongs to them, mm -hmm. which is both, not just one. Um, and some, fami some families decided just to go with one, and I think that's fine, but like, at least for us, um, just trying to make connections and uh, spend the effort and the energy to, to do that. Mm, thank you. Last question, Mpo. <laughs> well, let's take two last, and then uh, Mpo and Lebo, and then... Uh. I will. I actually don't have a question. I have a comment to what Bethany was saying. Um, it's about planting seeds. Um, so you don't always have to be the person who germinates the seed. So you plant the seed to say, just the same as the gospel, man. You plant the seed of a language. You plant the seed of, some, they're gonna meet a friend somewhere who speaks Zulu and they're gonna be like, oh my gosh, now I want to learn Zulu. But you've planted, you planted a seed as a parent, right? And someone else might water it. Kids always think their friends are cool. Um, and sometimes they, they prefer a language to another language because, yeah, it is what it is at the moment. And then you get older. Like, I know I didn't grow up with my dad's side of the family, so I barely spoke the language. But then the older I got, it seemed cool to be, like, bilingual, multilingual. Then I was like, ooh, I want to know. Now I want to know on my own terms. 
um, then I wanted to know, but there was like a seed planted, I remembered, oh, I heard these people say this, and these people say that, and then I started learning, and now I'm like, I can fully hear this language, and my speaking is very broken, but like, I can do it. Um, so it, as a parent, I think the, there's so much pressure to get it right, and for your kids to be model kids who are like fluent and whatever, and then your kids are just like, no, I don't want to. Like, I'm not gonna do that. Um, but you can plant a seed and, and kind of allow it to be watered and germinated along the way. And that's the beauty of community and the beauty of having other people who are helping you kind of raise as a community because then you don't end up with the pressure of, I'm a bad parent because I'm trying to teach this kid something and it's not coming to fruition. Look at you only speaking English. But the more you kind of plant and trust mm -hmm. one day, <laughs> something might come from that. Yeah, yeah, thank you. I just want to make a comment of that, like speci specifically with language. Um, I had Abby when, like, I, I was trying to speak more Spanish with them, and then Abby looks at me and says, Mommy, can you please speak English? Don't speak your funny language. And that is a dagger to your, to your heart. Because it's, it hurts, it's your language, you know? Like, and then you just let that go. And then later, like, as, as, like just mm -hmm. connections develops, and, yeah. and plant seeds. And then now, like, she's going to, to Spanish lessons and taking her homework to, to tell all her friends at school about her yeah. Spanish lessons. So yeah. it, it does get better. <laughs> Um, this question is for Jake, Lerato, and Carrie, specifically because you spoke about syncretism in your culture. I wanted to know what has it cost you to follow Jesus? Um, and I, I ask that because I come from a, my, my grandfather was a Dutch reformed pastor. My grandmother practiced witchcraft. My father was an atheist. My mom is a staunch Christian. So there's always a lot of conflict at home if you get sick, we have to go to the traditional doctor. But my mom wants to take us to church. And as I grew older, I had to stand up to my dad and say, no, I'm not going to take this for my sickness. But it's very difficult. It was very difficult. And um, I just, I'm just curious from your experience, what did it cost you when you decided I'm going to follow Jesus and say no to the practices that were within your family? I would like to answer this one first because I actually do have a similar experience. So my mom's side of the family, they are Cossas, right? So they are very much into their ancestral belief. They, they, they did the works. If I've seen anything with ancestral stuff, it's from her side of the family. But my mom has always been the, the Christian in her family, right? So watching her um, kind of, okay, so there was a time where she had to respect her parents, you know, trying to accommodate them in what they believed and also trying to um, not get too much into it that she lost what she believed, right? So there would be things that she would partake in, there would, th there would be things that she did not partake in, but I noticed that there was actually a fine line because which ones are you letting go and which ones are you taking, are you taking in? And so there was a time where they, they had a ceremony at her, her family home and I remember my dad at the sa on the same day had a meeting. I was doing business with my dad, and we had a meeting at a community hall. So I used that as my excuse to ditch the stuff from, from her house. I'm not saying you should do the same, but I did that. I was like, I took an, a very executive decision because I got convicted on that day specifically, and I think it was the first time that I got convicted of that type of situation. And I, I ditched. I told them I'm, coming, I'm going to a meeting and I will be back in time for the ceremony. And then when the ceremony was, was about to start, I remember I was done with the meeting, but I didn't go home. I went to my friend's house to get my nails done. And then I spent the day there up until I knew that the time, like the ceremony was almost over. Now people are eating. So when I got there, I remember my, my a great aunt, my mom's older sister, I loved her to death. You know, she... she She's like my mom too, you know, and seeing her disappointed face really made me feel so bad for choosing Christ, okay? So I felt so, so disappointed, but I was like, the, I'm, I'm not, I don't want to enforce things in my life that I don't have yet the spiritual power to fight, 
right? I'm not spiritually sound enough to be contending with such high um, things in the spirit, right? So I ditched this because I felt convicted. And what I will have to do now is deal with their disappointed faces. And as a child, I'm going to humble myself. I'm not going to contend with them. I'm not going to try to prove myself right or try to defend the religion that I have followed. But I'm just going to wash the dishes with my mouth shut. And that's what I did. And I'm just saying to you, um, you follow the conviction that, that the Holy Spirit tags in your heart. It's difficult. It's not going to be easy. And you'd find that there are more fights than not. But you know, the fight is not your own, you know. And when you choose Christ the whole time, he will always, like the Bible says, he always leaves you with a way out. So there will always be a way out that you can take to try and avoid everything that's contrary to what you're choosing to believe. Yeah, I think that was, that was beautifully said. And I, I can resonate a lot with that because um, the, the challenge for us, I think, as a family was, um, I think even for me personally, was loneliness, right? It's like, yeah, but we all believe in God. Why are you taking him so seriously? You know, and, and that's, that's the problem when you're trying to minister to a culture that thinks, yeah, we have enough of God in this section of our lives, but we don't go further than that. So it makes it very lonely, like as you, you like a betrayer, I, I, I got that a lot from my family, like, this is, this is a foreign thing and you're taking it too seriously, you are losing yourself. So it meant that um, it was a very lonely journey. But then I was challenged as I grew up to, to not be combative, um, because I realized that I had a very self-preservation mindset, uh, even as a Christian. I wasn't trying to reach out to be loving. I wanted them to just snap out of it, come along with me and just forsake all of that. I remember like when I became a Christian, I was very staunch. I said to my mom, all of this is stopping, like no slaughtering, none of this is going to happen in this house. And she was like, yeah, okay, cool. And then it was fine for a couple of months, but then, you know, then it, things started again. Uh, and I, I'm, I'm grateful that my mom was always very receptive. Like my mom was always like, because I would read scriptures to, say, to her to say, this is why I believe this. This is what the Bible teaches. Do you believe it? Yeah, 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 I believe it. Uh, but it's a long, it's a long journey. So it, it, it's cost a lot because it means that your family members see you as abandoning them. Um, it is very lonely because you're wrestling with your own faith. You're wrestling with rejection from other people. Um, but I think what I've come to, to learn is just to adopt a posture of uh, being loving uh, and being serving and understanding that the same way that Christ has, has been patient with you and loved you and changed you is what we need to extend uh, to people as well. So, yeah. I definitely agree with the two of you. Um, it's, it's a lonely place to be, especially when you just become a Christian, because you are so like, you just want people to see what you see, to experience what you see, but they are not there at all. Um, and, and they look at you like, we lost you. You are like... What, what's happening to you? Um, I remember, um, so my family was, we, we, when you are born in Mexico, you were born Catholic. Um, and the hospital arrived in my house through my grandmother when I was um, maybe 15, 16. And it took me like five years for myself to, to become a Christian. And I remember after we were um, following Christ, there is lots of things, lots of act family activities that are around idol worship at, uh, in Mexico. Um, and especially Christmas, which is like such an important time of the year. Uh, in Mexico, they put like a, um, they call it, um, ¿cómo se llama? En la Navidad con el Niño Dios. El Nacimiento. El pesebre, el nacimiento. Uh, it's like um, like this scene of Bethlehem with the baby Jesus and the Mary Joseph. But actually, people pray to this. There is uh, like the rosary. There is, um, and the food is actually, it's food that, that the family is going to eat, but it's offered to this idol. And and it's it's a very lonely place to not be able to, to participate. 
Um, at the beginning, obviously, everybody, like there was lots of fights and lots of confrontation because we were saying to, the, to our family, no, this is not right, this is not right, we shouldn't do this, and they were saying, like, you're absolutely crazy, we're doing this. So at some point, we stopped going to, this is on my, on my father's side, we stopped going there for a while, and then as we grew in maturity, <laughs> We started going after they finished with all the all the um, praying and all the activities to spend time with the family, um, and like like that, like th there are things as I say they cannot be redeemed in 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 the cultures, but I think trying to make a bridge for relationships to continue relationships with our family that was important, but it's very lonely. You feel very rejected, and as well when you're younger. You don't understand why is all this fighting, um, but um, we continue doing that, continue doing that, and I think um, after a while, like my just before my grandmother, especially my mom, was a very good uh, witness to to my dad's side of the family. Um, when my grandmother was um, at the hospital, she she passed away there. My mom was there all the time with her, and she received the Lord just before passing away. So I think it's, it is very hard, it is very lonely, but if you are firm and you have the conviction of the Holy Spirit where that line is, and it's, it's very hard, it's very hard because the tamales smell delicious, <laughs> and, and you want to eat <laughs> because it's the family recipe, but you can't. You know, yeah. like it, those, those type of things, so, yeah. Yeah. So I think there will be a loss of family when we, at points, um, have to stand with where the gospel line stands. I think, for myself, there's practices that would be experienced or practiced within the family setting that I would have to say I'm not going to participate in. So if there's a death, there might be rituals that are being performed on all the men. And uh, over time, they've come to know where I stand, that I'm not going to participate in those practices. I would still be there, um, but I would not participate in certain practices. But it's come through lots of conversation and lots of trying to understand, lots of asking questions. So why are you doing this? Um, trying to understand why, they, why they're really holding fast to these ideas. And many times, they don't actually know. It's because they've inherited these ideas over time, and, and that, that holding fast is because they believe this is part of their identity. Then there's also this idea that you, you've been colonized, your mind is, is being captured, captured by this Western identity. So it's trying to find moments when you, when you speak into that and, and to bring truth and, and just maybe even challenge this idea of this Western gospel. It's not a Western gospel. It's come here first through Ethiopia before it went to the West. So how can it be a Western? <laughs> so it's finding the right moments to, to speak, um, but also not withdrawing completely, but finding moments to be within those spaces, but holding fast to the line. So there's a tension. There's a tension to, to want to speak, but not be competitive. Uh, but there's also a tension of wanting to hold the line, but also being within those spaces to create the opportunity to have conversation. And at times you're alienated, and at times you're brought near, and then it seems that this one thinks he knows too much, and then you push back, and then there's this, there's this delicate balance of, of trying to both be still within those spaces, but bringing the gospel to challenge those views. Yeah. So, fam, this is the end of the panel discussion. You're welcome to keep asking the questions. There's lots of people. Um, this is a great space for us to get to know one another better. So thank you. Thank you to the, uh, our panelists. Thank you very much for sharing yourself. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pray for us, and then we're going to enjoy some time uh, of food together. We're going to share a meal. There are some dishes there. There is chicken, as we, we said there would be. Um, let me pray for us, and then we'll get into that segment of our program. Um, Lord, we thank you that um, um, there's much diversity that sits here, but there's a common thread that's brought by Christ who died on the cross for our sins. Mm -hmm. That through the death of Christ, we are brought near to you. And then the diversity that lives within us um, is also brought near to you. 
then we get to know and enjoy and understand one another as we l- turn away from being shoulder to shoulder and turn towards being eye to eye as we get to know one another better. So we thank you for what you're doing here within this transcultural church. And we, we pray that you would continue to do that, to help us to reflect, embrace, and enjoy the diversity that lives within our context, to help us to get to know one another better, to help us to build this, this joy, this love for one another, to help us to open these spaces so that others can see how the work of the Holy Spirit at work can create one new community in Christ. For we know that it's only by the power of the Holy Spirit that we can be one community in, in Christ, where there is a redemption, where the redemption is needed, where there is a forgiveness, where there's understanding, where there's a soft hearts and love for one another, only by the power of the Holy Spirit. We pray for the food we're about to receive now. We pray that we enjoy that that the food would be good for our bodies and would nourish our bodies. And we pray for our time together. And may it be a joyful time as we get to know one another better. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, church.